second. So the nice presentation is going to be capacity building. Although it's lesson five, it's the first lesson for the purpose of this particular workshop. So first we want to start off with what is a 501c3? So read to me that first paragraph related to what a the legal term for a 501c3. To be tax exempt under section 501c3 of the Internal Revenue Code, an organization must be organized and operated exclusively for exempt purposes set forth in section 501c3 and none of its earnings may inure to any private shareholder or individual. In addition, it may not be an action organization. It may not attempt to influence legislation as a substantial part of its activities, and it may not participate in any campaign activities for or against political candidates. So what are three things that we take away from this? First, that it's um you cannot uh you cannot uh support a political candidate. You know the elections are up and a politician comes to you and say, hey, look, we we'll appreciate you if your organization support me. That's a no-no when it relates to 501 c 3 the second thing is that you cannot spend most of your time trying to to um in, influence legislation. Most I'll of your say program, that okay. most of your time should be spent providing program services. The third thing is that you cannot uh use the money for a proper purpose. It has to be related to the five hundred one c three. So far, so good. Okay, give me number three again. Number three is that it must be organized exclusively for exempt purposes and not for private purposes. For example, you can't put money in your pocket. When money goes in, it goes into the non-profit. Well, so a for-profit can put the money in his own pocket. For the nonprofit, it goes directly into the nonprofit. And I'll say you this, and you can reread this, and then it's going to make sense. Okay. Okay, let's continue. Now, these are the critical things that should be in place in terms of organizational or capacity. We start with the why. The first question you want to ask. Why does your organization exist? What problem do you address? And we're going to go in depth in terms of trying to explain what a problem is in a problem statement later on during the less, less, lessons, future lessons. lessons. The next is, who are we? What makes your organization uniquely qualified to lead this effort? And more importantly, Show your experience and qualification. The next thing is, what programs and activities do you propose to, to solve the problem? If there's a problem, there should be a program to solve it. Then you want to state your mission and your specific activities. Activity. We're going to go into an in-depth section on vision, mission, goals, and objectives. Next is, how will you implement these programs? We're going to talk about different strategies that we can use to implement a particular program. In that respect, you need to provide details of how your program and project will be implemented from day one to the close of the program. And then that's also always the question of how much would it cost to solve the problem? And what would it cost if you ignore the problem. So we're going to show you how to figure out those numbers as the cost, and then in terms of benefit. Now, in terms of organizational structure, 
you should have policies and procedures in place. Okay? Do you have yeah. policies and procedures in place? I'm working on that. You. Oh, no, I said get it for you. You, you, you. Yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. So you got it already, but yes. I know it only because it's part of organizational infrastructure. One of the first thing you wanted to do was simply put the policies and procedures in place, and then you want to move forward with the more in-depth class. So okay. we have the policies and procedures in place. The second thing is staff. And we're going to go over staffing later on in the upcoming lessons. Then funding sustainability. This is where we begin to talk about the grant writing section, how to write a grant and things of that nature. And then physical control. How do you control your finance? I'm asking you a question. Uh, how do I control it? Yes. I have a financial person who takes care of that. And you got a financial manual I gave you. I sent it for you. <laughs> okay. Your, fin your financial manual is important. You should go through it because it's going to tell you, for example, okay. how things hold, are hold on a minute. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, and then the, the, and then that deals with physical control. And then the next thing is we want to talk about how do you assess support resources for sustainability. And we're going to talk about that later on in the upcoming um, lessons. One of the um, first thing you want to do, and we're going to be working with you and putting this together, is to do what's, what's known as a SWOT um, analyst. Do you know what a SWOT analyst is? Yes, I've worked on that before. Good. Strengths. Weaknesses. weaknesses threats and opportunities. So we'll use this model in order to fold in your strengths, your weaknesses, your threats, and opportunity, because I'm going to do an assessment of your organization so that I can put together this type of analogy. Now, read for me what a vision is. The vision, the desire future, reflects your core values and beliefs and sets in motion a proactive direction for the organization. Can you tell me an individual that had a great vision? Me, Martin. <laughs> Besides you. Uh, he was a uh, man. Martin Luther King. Dr. King, Martin Luther King. His vision was a world where people are judged not by the content the of their, their skin, skin, but by the but character. Right. A vision <laughs> statement talks about the future. During that time when Dr. King uh, took on his journey, there was a situation where you couldn't, we as a people couldn't eat in restaurant. We couldn't use the same water fountain. We had to sit in the back of a bus. So his vision was a world where a person would be judged by the context of his character and not his, um, his uh, uh, color race. of his skin. Right, definitely. So we're going to be working with you. We're going to look at your vision and we're going to, uh, see if we can improve that vision or if it's just perfect the way it is. And we'll talk about that in future classes. Now, you got your vision. The next is the mission. What is the mission? The mission, the plan of action, becomes the driving force of the organization. It is a broad statement that summarizes your plan of action. It should be short, concise, and measurable. In a future class, we want to show you a model to put together the mission statement. Okay. Let's talk about building a strong oversight body. 
and read that for me. In a separate nonprofit organization, the board of directors is the governing authority that is legally responsible for the integrity of the physical and programmatic functions of the organization. So the board is responsible for the physical, or in other words, overseeing the money. And they're also responsible for the programmatic uh, function of the uh, organization. Let's continue on. Now, let's talk about the multi roles of the board. Setting policy, <clears throat> strategic planning. One of the things we're going to be doing is putting together your strategic plan. So continue on. Hiring the CEO. Yeah, yeah definitely hiring the CEO. And who's going to be the CEO of your organization? I'm the CEO. Okay. All right. Continue. Advocacy. Yeah, you got to advocate. And that's one of the reasons why you're taking this training. So you can talk to people and advocate to convince them why they should fund your programs and your organization. Next. Fundraising. Physical and legal oversight. Recruiting new board members. These are all of the roles in general of a board of directors. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you just in case someone asks you, well, what is the role of your board of directors? That you'll be able to say, well, what we do as a board of directors, A, B, C, and D. Good enough? Yes. Let's continue. Now, very important. Let's talk about the legal. Let me emphasize this. The legal responsibility of the board of directors and read those responsibilities. Duty of care, competence, and the exercise of reasonable care in making decisions. Duty of loyalty, undivided allegiance, and the avoidance of conflicts of interest. Duty of obedience, faithful to the organization's mission and goals. Now, each one of your board of directors who signed this document. Um, and, and, and it's important because you want to make sure none of your board of directors turn against you. So let's say, for example, it's a board meeting. Y'all got this fantastic idea, right? And then a board member run and tell somebody else mm -hmm. about that idea. Well, under this right here, you can't do that. Okay. You know, everything is kept confidential. Also, as a um, as a board member, it's a duty of loyalty, loyalty, knowing that they're not doing anything that will present a conflict of interest. So far, so good? So far, so good. Let's go. Okay, we just right here. As the governing body, the board is responsible for the organization. Therefore, it is the most vulnerable to lawsuit. What does that mean? That means as a board of directors, if you're not watching over on how the operation is going in terms of physical control, you could be sued. And we're going to talk about how to protect yourself from being sued. Okay, let's talk about protecting the board of directors. Starting with Direct directing the board. Are considered liable to third parties when board members knowingly participate in wrongdoing. Oh, can you give me an example? Uh, well, the one that you just said where an idea or something is discussed within our meeting and then they go and share those ideas with someone else. Another thing would be, for example, if the board is that if y'all had a youth program and the board knew that the person that y'all was bringing on board had a child molestation okay. on this record. Mm -hmm. That's a clear example of a board doing wrong doing. Because the board is supposed to oversee and make sure everything is okay. Next. Okay. The nonprofit act outside of or in some way inconsistent with 
its bona fide status as a nonprofit. You know your mission, you know your purpose. But let's say, for example, you decide to start to spend money and show them senior citizen how to jump, how to jump, jump rope. Is that a problem? Yes, because I'm working with children. Exactly. Now you see the point. It's got to be consistent. With the nonprofit vision and mission, and you cannot do anything other than that. You'll be surprised at the number of nonprofits that go out of that boundary. You can lose your status. Okay, let's read this. Board members had either reason to know of wrongdoing or were negligent in not knowing of wrongdoing by the organization. That's important. Board members that know or should have known, you're still responsible for that. Now, if you didn't know and something bad happened, then you can't come back to the board of directors. But if the board knew that, let me give you another example. Let's say your office. One of your employees drops a water on the floor and they put nothing to indicate wet floor. And a client comes in and that client trip and fall. And the board know this. They know that, them, that your, your staff never put up anything when waters drop on the floor. So yeah, you could be sued now. Because you knew or know or you should have known that you was putting somebody's uh life in jeopardy. That makes sense? Yes. Okay, let's talk about how do you protect yourself? And give me the three key, three keys that how you protect yourself. Knowledge protects. Be informed on directors and officers insurance, indem indemnification, volunteer protection act. Have you ever heard of identification? Identification. I don't. I haven't heard that word now. When you explain it to me, I may yes, know what you're very, talking about, very, but I've never heard that word yeah, heard. Yeah, identification is a clause in your articles. If you go to your call articles of incorporation, you see it, that says that the board of directors should not be responsible for the acts of the corporation. That is, if you sue us, you can sue the corporation, but you cannot sue us individually. Okay. That's what identification means. You identify yourself. You protect your board of directors. Okay. The only way you can be sued as a board individually if the board knowingly knew something was wrong and did nothing wrong, right? I mean, okay. it did nothing to correct it. Other than that, you're protected, and you're protected by what's called directors and board officer insurance. At the very minimum, what you want to do is get a million dollars worth of insurance, directors and board insurance. But you want to do this later on down the line when you got a physical office and things of that nature. Okay, and then you want to have a volunteer protection act. That is, you want to protect your employee, your volunteers. And you want to let them know that, hey, the, the volunteer here, we, we will protect you just as much as if we was employed. Okay, let's continue. Now, let's continue to talk about more about protecting the board of directors. Read the three. Risk management assessment, risk management plan, general liability. Risk management assessment, man, you got a book that tell people, hey, look, if water drop on the floor, you're responsible for cleaning that up. If you see a child in the office and that child is putting itself in danger, you're responsible for stopping that. That's what risk management means. You assess all of the possibilities and you let the employees know what they're responsible for. General, li general liability is the type of board insurance that you want to get. General liability protects the board, but it also protects, let's say if you gave an event outside and someone got hurt, you still got your board insurance. That's why we call it general uh, liability. 
Okay, let's read this. The board of directors should meet at least quarterly and maintain minutes that include the date, time, place of meeting, names of members present and absent, and summary of discussion and action taken. It is required as a 501c3 or corporation in general to take minutes when you meet. Now, how often is your board of directors going to be meeting? How often? I'd say to start quarterly. Yeah, qu monthly, quarterly, whatever that time you uh you decide. And then can be no more than a Zoom meeting. Give me, you say, look, I meant this, I did that. This is the organization budget. This is uh the program that the organization has. This is how we do these programs, bam. But it's mandatory that you take minutes. And it's mandatory that you meet at least quarterly. Some nonprofits meet monthly, uh, or some meet, but at least quarterly. Not every six months, but at the minimum of quarterly. That makes sense? Yes. And you must designate, and in your bylaws, it designate the dates that y'all meet. That's okay. important because board members need to know. Well, we meet the third Wednesday of every month. Right. They need to know that going in. Okay? So that's in the uh, bylaw, so they can know how often you meet, what time you meet, et cetera. Okay, let's talk about what a mature board member is. A strategic thinker, diversity in skills, expertise, and background ownership of mission, and advocacy. These are the things you want to look for when you uh, bring your um, on board, um, your board of directors on board, or if you decide to expand your board of directors. You're looking at these things right here. These are four things here. Okay, let's talk about the committees that a board of directors should have, at least if they are... Uh, a board of directors, let's say maybe a seven or more board of directors. What are those committees? Executive committee, resource development, marketing, nominating, finance. Now, um, this is if you got seven or more board members. Sometimes a board is so small that everybody's serving all of these positions as opposed to delegating to Pacific uh, board members. Okay. Now, let's talk about the strategic plan. As you know, we're going to be putting together a five-year strategic plan for your organization. A strategic plan is where you want to be in the future and maps the course to get there. It provides the roadmap for goals, details, and timeline of the mission to the desired future, the vision. Exactly. That's what that five-year plan is going to do. And let people know what are your expectations for year one, year two, year three, on up to our uh, year five. Okay. Now, they give a breakdown of what a strategic plan consists of. Mission, which includes the services or programs, management, human resources, and internal operations, money, budget, forecasting, funding, physical controls, marketing, positioning, branding, promotion. Your strategic plan slash business plan is going to consist of all of these different components. Okay, let's talk about the different parts of the plan. The executive sum summary makes the first impression. It describes your current organization, accomplishments, and where you want to be. Most times, if the person can't get past your executive summary, they're not going to read the rest of the document. Next. The program description is the heart of the mission. It describes your programs, goals, objectives, and evaluation. And we're going to be putting together what's known as a program design. 
when we get to the program section. Next. The market are the people who benefit from your services and the people who support your services. It is the organization's customers. Exactly. Your customers are those folks. And you can have different types of customers. You can have a customer that you're providing a service for, and then another customer, someone, those people that's giving you money. So you're going to have basically two types of customers, your donors, renters, and then the people, clients that you provide the service for. Okay? Let's continue. The operations are the internal controls and systems that support the infrastructure of the organization. It describes changes that needs to take place in the infrastructure. The operation is what time does your office open? What time does it close? Um, it gives a description of who does what. All that stuff is part of your uh, operation. The Next. timeline is the schedule for getting things done. It includes milestones and action steps to be achieved, as well as reporting methods. For example, well, in our first 90 days, we plan to do this. In 160 days, we plan to do this. In uh, eight months, we plan to do this. And in the year, we plan to do this. Next. Financing covers your plan to fund the mission and operations. It includes budgets and specific strategies to acquire funds. And that's what we're going to be talking about in depth when we deal with the strategic plan as well as um, the grand widening section. Okay, continue. Basics of human resource management. Staff recruitment, screening, and selection are critical aspects of the human resource process. Staff selection should be made on the basis of qualifications, experience, and credentials. Only trained, qualified employees who meet appropriate legal licensing education or a certification requirement should provide services. Exactly. Next. The organization should have an annual staff development plan based on the program design and identified staff needs. That's, full -time. Important. that's, that's important because every year you want to go back, have a staff um, uh, 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 meeting, yearly meeting, to talk about, hey, is our programs meeting the needs that should be met? Hey. Are there only uh, are there any other new program strategies that has come about since our start that we can use to implement in our program? Staff always have to be up to date on programs. Full time staff should be required to get a specific number of hours per year, continuing education credits, and topics that impact their performance. At least once a month, training should be provided on various professional, personal, and job-related topics. Yeah, that's important because you always want to make sure they keep them up to par. And then job performance and evaluation and the assessment of job performance of the evaluation related to description. And then, of course, we talk about this. You should have policies and procedures that serves as a rich management tool in providing guidelines, your legal and your core values as well. Again, your policy governor organization and should be reviewed and approved by the board of, of the board of directors annually. Every year, you should re-look at your policies and procedures and say that they're working for us or they don't. What is, well, that's a policy. What is a procedure? The way things are done. Okay, it's the way you manage the organization. A lot of people get policies, conflict with procedures when they're two different things. One talk about how you govern the organization, and the other talk about how you manage the manage. organization. Okay, and then they give 
um, concerns about um, confusion over nonprofit employee uh, uh, classification. Do you know the difference between an exempt and a non-exempt employee? If you're exempt, that means that certain certain um, policy it's a exempt is like your grandfathered in. Yeah. Non-exempt means That's that, but non-exempt is like okay, you have to take whatever training has to be done. I hear you, my sister. You was, my sister. You was struggling with it, right? But let's see what they say. Let's okay. get done. Okay. Read that right there about a lack of knowledge. The lack of knowledge or understanding of the two can lead to a considerable amount of overtime pay due to an employee incorrectly handled as an exempt employee. Yes. Let's go now. Let's talk about an exempt employee. Read what an exempt employee is. Exempt employees include those who are not subject to the overtime provisions and other employment conditions defined by the FLSA. Generally, such employees are those occupying executive, administrative, professional, and outside sales positions. And these are called exempt employees. They don't get overtime. Why do you think they don't get overtime? Because they normally got big checks. That's why, you know, the executive, they're in the executive branch. So they're getting the real dollar. Okay, now let's see what a non-exempt employee is. Must comply with the overtime pay provisions of the say and applicable state laws regardless of individual titles or duties. This includes the payment of overtime for hours work in excess of 40 hours per week. Like you can't say to the janitor, well, I want you to work 60 hours, but I'm only going to pay you for 40 hours. Because mm -hmm. it's not an exempt employee. Only an exempt. You can't tell your secretary that, yeah, I know you're supposed to work 40 hours, but I need you to work 60 hours, and I only pay you for 40 hours. Not going to have, but your executive assistant, because she's up there in your calendar, you can tell her that. You know, you can say, no, I need to work 60 hours, although you're being paid for 40. It's important that you know the distinction between these two, because that employee can sue, sue you. Or the Department of Labor can come in, and they can sue you and penalize you. So far, so good. Let's go. Okay. Now, this right here, we're not going to go over all this. You can read this at your leisure. And you're not going to need this right now, but when you start to bring in volunteers, then you should try to have at least 15% of your uh, staff should be volunteers. Say that again? At least 15% of your staff should be volunteers. And do you know how easy it is to get volunteers? Yeah, you can use to get volunteers. Yeah. It's easy. You can go to colleges. They want to schools, high school, yeah. middle school, because yes. I'm working yes. with younger kids. Every corporation will let you use their employees. But at some point right. you put together uh in a, 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 a manual for your volunteers, similar to your manual for your um for your um uh uh, uh pay staff. Basically, they are basically the same. The only difference is that your pay staff got money attached to it. Okay, let's continue. What are the three primary elements of a good volunteer plan? Recruitment, retention, recognition. You should be able to have a good 
policy on how to recruit them and how to retain them. retain them. And the way you retain them is not to take them for granted. Right. For example, you might have a luncheon every month for your volunteers, right? You might have discount cards that you give your volunteers, but you don't want to take them for granted. And the other way of recognizing them, again, not only lunch, but also give them like certificates and awards and mm -hmm. things of that nature. They love that. All right, getting physical now. Read this for me. It is paramount that the organization establishes a system of internal controls for accountability of all funds received and dispersed. It is critical. Mm -hmm. That when you get people's money, you understand the physical control. It's good that your accountant know it, but you should also have at least a general idea on what's going on so you're not caught in the blind if you decide to bring on an accountant that likes to dip in the money. You want to be able to know what those things look like, what money's supposed to go where, and be able to go and um, uh, uh, do that final check to make sure those numbers are right. Okay, let's talk about the four major concepts of internal control. Segregation of functions, proper authorization. Hold on a minute, I'm taking a picture of this particular one. Okay. Okay, segregation of functions, proper authorization, proper recording of transactions, limiting access to assets. Now, why do you don't have to worry about this one too much? Because the financial, well, you have a financial person doing it, almost but there. still, you should always be, a, you yeah, should still have what? to stay on top of it. Your financial management, the manual we did for financial, it has all of this. Okay. It breaks it down to proper authorization. For example, if you notice, you have two signatures. You have to sign off on the check, and like either the uh, president or the treasurer has to sign off on the check. Right. But fortunately, we did this for you already. So when you go back to that financial, you're going to say, oh, I see what Mike means by segregation of funds, functions. For example, if you got a grant from the children's board, you don't want to go, you don't want to co-mingle it with a grant from the Red Cross, for example. You want to make sure you got all those accounts separate and in separate accounts. That makes sense? Yes. Okay. Okay, read this for me. It is highly recommended that your organization use an automated accounting system to record all transactions pertaining to revenues and expenditures using generally accepted accounting principles. Now the software mm -hmm. that most people use in order to meet this requirement is called QuickBooks. And you got QuickBooks for nonprofits and you got QuickBooks for for profits, but you want to get to QuickBooks for nonprofits. And I'm gonna talk share with you how you get that software at dirt cheap prices through this organization that's called TechSoup. And we'll talk about TechSoup later on. TechSoup. Okay, can you spell that for me? Yeah. T E C A Tech T E C A? No. T E C H Tech. H Tech. Soup. Like you got eating soup? Soup. Yeah, Tech Soup. Look that up for me when you get a chance. Okay, because I have a young lady that's coming over tomorrow, and we're going to be looking at that. Excellent. Yeah, TechSoup is where you go to get all of your software dirt cheap. Okay. Now, if you was to go to get, let's say, um, uh, QuickBooks from the private sector, mm -hmm. it might cost you a couple hundred dollars. Okay. Where you go, if you go to QuickBooks, I mean, if you go to... um. TechSoup is um is less. Okay. What TechSoup is is a nonprofit. Okay. Clearinghouse. 
All okay. the major corporations like Microsoft, Adobe, etc., give them software. And then they're charged with giving this software at a discount price to nonprofits. Okay. Okay. Let's continue. Let's talk about some more about the minimum account the system. A system at a minimum should include chart of accounts, general ledger and subsidiary ledgers, accounts receivable and payable, and payroll information. That um, QuickBook does all of this. Plus me. Okay, continue. The accounting system at a minimum should include financial reports, the budget, bank reconciliation, tax information, and inventory. Now, how much tax information do you have to worry about? How much what? Tax information do you have to worry about? That's their job. You don't because you're 501c3. You exempt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're exempt from paying taxes. But if you were a for-profit corporation, then that tax information is important. Okay. Okay? Okay, good. Now, let's talk about the other um, internal control. Annual operating budget, restricted, ac ac restricted access to assets. That, boy, yeah. those words right there. I'm telling you, <laughs> access is getting a hold of the the money. That's right. why I know right. what that means. You're restricted. You can't right. just go in and just get it for anything. That's why only two people are signatures: yourself, your treasurer, or your um president. That's how you reduce access to um you reduce access to your access. Okay. Is that right? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And every year, um, especially when you start bringing in over, let's say, twenty, thirty thousand dollars now, you want to get an independent audit to come in. Okay. And this person is not the accountant, but it's somebody that don't know any of you. They come in and they check to make sure that you are legit and everything you say that you did, you did. They okay. look like maybe 10 or 15 percent of your work. Randomly, they don't tell you what they're gonna look at, but at least that yeah. they may okay. look at every other fourth check, or every other third check, just to make sure everything is consistent. Okay. Okay. Oops. That brings oh. us to the conclusion. Now, every class, I'm always gonna ask two things that you learned from the nice class that you didn't know. Oh. <laughs> Okay, let me put this on pause. Okay. 